morning. But I'm going to move on and introduce our next speaker. Uh, joining us for our final talk before our lunch break is Dr. Josephine Rogers, who earned her PhD from Rutgers University, focusing on 19th century American art. Since 2018, she has been working with uh, Mark D. Mitchell, the Holcomb T. Green Curator of American Paintings and Sculpture at the Yale University Art Gallery, coordinating details for the gallery's upcoming exhibition, The Expressive Figure in the American Renaissance, 1876 to 1917. She has held positions at the Smithsonian Institute, National Portrait Gallery, and the National Gallery of Art, and the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Today, she will be presenting to us Mary Way, Petite Pictures and Grand Acts of Fidelity. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I actually am a member of the DAR, and, uh, I saw, <laughs> and I saw this as an opportunity to come back and to, um, I think I'm a little bit more of a in depth view of my face, but um, I decided to apply for this um, call for papers because I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to come back. I had not seen the headquarters since the renovation, and so it was wonderful to see the exhibition and participate. Um, I actually worked on this project as a fellow at Yale, and okay. Um, so, at a fellow, as a fellow in the uh, Department of American um, Painting and Sculpture, I put together a small exhibition on Mary Way in 2020, and unfortunately, no one was able to see it because the gallery was closed. So, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to share my research and to come back. To you. Um, I wanted, before starting, I tell you it's wonderful to follow up after um, you two wonderful talks this morning. Um, with, in relation to our collections at Yale, um, the Yale Art Gallery has one of the largest collections of, of, sorry, of uh, miniature paintings. And um, we, uh, John Trumbull opened our gallery in 1832, and he actually, his practice of painting his large portraits is actually starting with miniatures. So we have a full collection of his, uh, the miniatures that were survived in his estate um, at the time of his death. And it's interesting because they were always valued for um, Trumbull's wonderful contribution to our understanding of, the, of our own history in the United States with it, his dedication to capturing the likeness in his portraiture. So whenever we describe those, that collection, it's all within the details of uh, kind of a connoisseurship of, 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 of capturing the sitter in front of him and having um, a, a portrait that um, would then um, pass on that likeness to further generations. Um, our collection is always in the teaching collection. So we've continued to expand. We now have about 300 miniatures. Um, and one of them in particular that my boss, Mark Mitchell, purchased in 2016 um, is of, a, of an enslaved um, Rose Prentice, which when this came to the collection, we, it was identified as Rose Tuff. And it was um, completed by a female uh, miniature painter, Sarah Goodrich, who was very famous in Boston at the time. And so there's actually an exhibition now uh, curated by Keely Goldman um, and Micheline Thomas. The title is Micheline Thomas Portrait of an Unlikely Space. And so in that instance, they're really trying to um, show, and similar to how we're talking about portraits in the home here, they're trying to find a space to show these works that were then in, in the period um, so rare. There's only about 10 known of likenesses to Rose's portrait. So um, I just thought it was really interesting because they actually use the words of um, writers such as Harmon, who, Jude Harmon, who we saw today, and Phyllis Willoughby, who, to give it some kind of presence. And then the second thing that I will just mention here, so this is a portrait, <laughs> picture of me um, just in front of the case. So we always have, we have a gallery dedicated to miniatures, um, that are always on view. So I hope you please come and visit the Yale Art Gallery. But it's just to give you a sense, sense of scale. Um, the miniature we'll be focusing on today is the one on the upper right corner. And in a kind of connection to this idea of visual aids and how it's linked to being worn and, and jewelry, it is, these are pieces of, of jewelry as well. So that's my kind of 
brief introduction. Thank you so much for being here. Measuring just over two inches in diameter, this miniature portrait of an unknown gentleman is by Mary Way. It depicts a male sitter whose fine curls and braid, along with white powder, powder contouring his hairline, the height of fashion in New London, Connecticut during the 1790s. Though confined to such a small surface, the, images, the image resonates with copious personal details. A lock of hair is concealed in the backing. Sections of the gold are missing on the back of the clasp due to rubbing against the body. Upon close examination of the object, the sitter's individual character emerges, though his identity is unknown. The profile, carefully rendered on paper in watercolor and then cut out and applied to a black silk ground, accentuates his distinctly, distinctly long nose and high cheekbones. The glimpse of bright blue in the sitter's eye and the graceful curve of his chin offer a sense of intimacy. Delicate pieces of lace and fabric from the sitter's distinguished attire, consisting of four separate pieces of fabric stitched together, um, two of the buttons of the silk waistcoat left open allow the ivory stock to billow against the sitter's chest. The combination of whimsy and meticulous detail made way a soft after, a sought after portraitist in an era when professional opportunities for women were limited. Today, I'm interested in how this portrait documents Way's participation in the construction of gendered and racial hierarchies in New London society. Addressing what the portrait reveals or admits, I will articulate how certain narratives traveled throughout the British colony. New London-born painters Mary Way, with life dates 1716 to 1833, and her sister Elizabeth Way Chaplin, um, 1771 to 18. 25, called Betsy, um, were active professional artists around 1790 and produced miniatures in a variety of styles and medium. In 1794, at the age of 23, Betsy married local captain James Chaplin and remained in New London. In 1811, Mary Way became, began advertising her works in New York newspapers as she supported herself as a professional art, artist in New York City until she lost her sight and returned to New London around 1820. A miniature signed and dated by Mary, signed and dated 1800 by Mary Way was purchased by Zeke um, Live Grant and published in the magazine Antiques in 1992 by William Warren. As a result, a history of the works that had been forgotten and lost from the Norwich or New London region of Connecticut, including this portrait purchased by Yale in 1940, was reattributed to Mary Way. The Way Sisters miniatures, Miniaturists of the Early Republic is an, a, an exhibition presented at the Lyman Allen Museum in 2021 and was the first exhibition devoted solely to Mary Way and Betsy Way Chapin. Curator Tanya Port was able to pre present 85 of the roughly 100 miniatures on ivory and paper that have been attributed to the Way Sisters. Through extensive genealogical research and art historical attention, the support and support from private collections, Court offers new insights into the social and artistic networks that established Mary Way's career. Way was born in New London, Connecticut before the Revo American Revolution. While completing commissions for relatives, neighbors, and clients within elite society of New London, she developed a distinctive style of painting, referred to as quote unquote dress miniatures. Exemplified in this work and given the descriptive title as gentleman and dated approximately 1800 when it was acquired by Yale University. Miniature painting is a tradition that flourished through it, throughout the British colonies. For a period of about 100 years, beginning around 1740, Americans craved new images. Ameri uh, artists followed cosmopolitan current trends in oil painting and watercolor on wafers of ivory from tusks of whalebone to offer portraits presenting a public image as well as private moments of reflection or mourning. After the revolution, Americans bought portraits with a radical amount and the market demanded portraits of individuals, couples, and families. As inheritable wealth accumulated in 18th century American society, portraits became a generational, generational document and a syncretic meet with with a synchronic, a synchronic meaning, not just of celebration of beauty, charm, or taste. The miniature's rise to popularity coincides with significant shifts in social attitudes towards love, marriage, and family. This group of portraits, now part of the Corkin Collection at the National Gallery of Art, demonstrates how miniatures were worn, worn cemented, and expressed close family relationships. 
1791, Edward Shippen was appointed the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and his family, including da daughter Sarah Chicken Lee, uh, commissioned Gilbert Stewart to commemorate this achievement. Following the completion of Edward's portrait in 1796, Stewart painted Sarah. The mood of her portrait is strikingly is in striking contrast to that of her father. Her expression conveys a cultural language of mourning. Her eyelids are slightly closed, white, bright pink cheeks convey strong emotion. Sarah's hair is styled in a French manner with curls loosely flowing over her empire style dress in front of a tree with autumn tones with leaves about to fall. Sarah lost her husband in 1793 and her mother in 19, oh, sorry, in 1794. The final act of mourning is revealed by, by wearing the miniature of her son, Robert. As Margareta Lovell, um, Lovell explains, the miniature quote, performs the function of a mnemonic, of mnemonic, sorry, mnemonic for Miss Lee in the same fashion of her full scale image on the wall in her, in her home points to viewers to her face form and her role, her position in both Perform, uh, present her position within the family web. By positioning question, or sorry, by posing questions of property, status, and function of the portrait as a social participant, it is possible to examine the larger social ecology out of which each miniature was decisively extracted. Uh, Mary's Way portrait of her second cousin, New London, Connecticut native Charles Holt, is the only surviving miniature that she signed. Whether Holt commissioned the portrait as a gift for his soon-to-be wife, Mary Dobbs, or whether Way presented the portrait to Holt as a token remains unknown. In 1800, Holt was the founder of a local, local B newspaper and was awaiting imprisonment for alleged sedition against the Federalist-run government. As the owner and publisher of the newspaper, Holt's original intention was to remain politically neutral in the partisan political climate of New Haven. I mean, sorry, New London. Expressing this uh, position in his, the paper's first issue on June 14, 1797, quote, the publisher of this paper is determined that his paper shall be, with respect to political dispositions, impartial in every sense of the word. After Federalist, end quote, after Federalist passed the Alien Sedition Act, Holt, Holt found himself boycotted for publishing a mi few misleading articles about the Republicans. On June 20th, 1798, Holt, Holt published in the B an editorial that read, quote, if the Constitution of the United States was not considered by the majority of the House of Representatives a mere dead letter, they would never have ventured into a bill directly um, contravening one of the most essential articles in the Code of Freedom, namely, namely liberty of speech, printing, and writing, end quote. On December 5th, 1798, Quote, uh, Holt published, quote, there are generally two sides to every subject. To the public opinion in a free country, there will, there will and should be. And it is the duty of an impartial printer to communicate to the public both sides freely. The public, therefore, rest assured, and so long as my brethren in this state print on one, one side, or will not print on one side only, so long as I print, end quote. And following this, on September 17, 1799, a Connecticut grand jury charged him with sedition, seditious criticism, and he was arrested and brought to Hartford for arraignment. In this portrait, Holt is portrayed in, a mil in an American militia styled uniform, although there is no record of his Connecticut militia service through the end of 1800. The costume appears to be an invention of Mary Way, a symbolic rendering, the high collar color blue uniform with red highlights um, is, a set, is reminiscent of the French Revolution uniforms of the early 1790s. However, the brass buttons um, along the um, jacket and the um, had cord and silver emulet are most suggestive of a militia, form, militia rather than a formal army. Together, a true imagine, uh, um, I'm sorry, together forming the two ideas of the republic of the of the republic the black cockade or cockade is standard from 1779 through 1815 for the militia and mary way's depiction of Holt apparel expresses her sympathy with her cousin's cause um, and the republican cause 
Gender Shaped Mary's Way's Artistic Career and Education. Uh, available evidence suggests that both Mary and Betsy received a typical education available for affluent daughters in New London, Connecticut, designed predominantly to culture a, quote, civilized taste, including writing, drawing, and needlework. Mary and Betsy began painting miniature portraits of neighbors and relatives in the 1790s. Mary did not marry and pursued a professional career in both New London and New York. To supplement, supplement her income, she taught painting, needlework, sewing skills, writing, and reading. Um, by 1818, she had established an impressive, list, an impressive list of clients and published advertisements for what she described as the Ladies Drawing Academy. The multiple media and, integra and integrated use of fabric, paint, and, and paper sets the sisters' work aside from other miniatures in the early republic. As, by, as Brian L. Rich describes, quote, not only are the dressed portraits unique in their style and production, the material bits and pieces of paper, fabric, and thread used to create, used in their creations, tell a story of New London life in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, end quote. The term dress miniature appears in the 1950s, but Mary Way was not attributed to this work until 1992. The sisters completed a variety of portrait styles in different media throughout their lives. However, it is the dress miniatures produced during the last decade of 18th century that set them apart. Mary began her career in the late 1780s, um, creating portraits with sewn and, a, and adhered fabric clothing. So here are two examples um, that also, I included the frame um, because there are, so Mary moved to New York in 1811 and because she left New London, there is actually correspondence. And so her family, um, descendants of her family, Ramsey McClellan, did publish a full thing of letters between Betsy and Mary. So we do know a little bit more about how Mary um, produced works just from those written accounts. Um, but we, there is some discussion, and in, in the exhibition, um, they were trying to really pull away from, or like trying to identify what Mary did and what Betsy had completed. And after this period of early, of really doing the dress miniatures, Betsy goes on to use more painting. And so this is kind of where the earliest um, detailed work is really from the 1790s. And on the left, the dress girl with a pattern rug retains the beautiful piece of the skirt, the sewn ruffle sleeves, and the intricate trim on, on the garment to accentuate artistry, labor, and love. The pattern fridge rug, dark background, and flower brings attention to the, use, the young child's beauty while offering a symbol of hope. Tanya Port explains the mirrored details, quote, enliven the experience and the three-dimensionality of their portraits, end quote. Some fool the eye, making it difficult to discern which materials are real and which are painted. As children of, um, as children during the American Revolution, Mary and Betsy witnessed the burning of their father Ebenezer Way's general store by the British. Um, Fort Griswold was also attacked on September 6, 18, 1781, killing over 80 men. The sisters began their artistic careers while the region was in a period of transition and phys physically being rebuilt. Men who fought in the revolution, later commissioned, oh no, <laughs> men who fought in the revolution later commissioned portraits to help preserve their legacies, such as General um, Comfort Sage of Middletown, Connecticut, who fought in Boston and in New York, and led efforts to um, repeal, um, it led efforts against British raids on Connecticut ports in July 1779. The dress portrait on the left. It depicts his son, Ebenezer William Sage. The face of the young, uh, the, the face and hair of the young gentleman are made out of woven paper and used as a support for the fine um, painting of, of his facial features. The clothing, clothing is a combination of paper and fabric and um, uh, sewn together and, and, and adhered onto uh, the fabric fashion. On the right, the marble paper is used as a framing device for the second portrait and unfortunately of the unknown um, sitter. Um, Brian Elrich has identified that this is a Turkish pattern paper 
that local mer merchants use to wrap dry goods, possibly even from their father's general store. The imagination, ingenuity, and resilience of the sister's creativity is remarkable. Most 18th and 19th century, most 18th and 19th century literature deploys miniature portraits as, a, as portraits to mediate social ties and signal emotional connection. Without knowing the identity of the sitter, this portrait departs from the intimate act of connection, instead leading the viewer to, to certain markings of social hierarchy. As portable objects, miniatures suited colonial life, which required constant renegotiation and reassertion of social networks of, and across vast distance. Catherine Kelly has shown ivory became the most popular backing material for miniature portraits during the 18th and 19th century, offering impervious, an impervious surface to delicately apply wash to accentuate pale skin tones and seemingly animated emotions. Miniatures ask viewers to recognize portrait subjects as people embedded within a particular social group, making these tiny images potential tools with, um, with which to cement familiar and political ties. The use of ivory solidified the miniature wearers or customers that, or customer occupied a particular position of power within constructing a refined American taste within the global networks of slavery, colonialism, and imperial trade. The material was dependent on enslaved labor and transatlantic distribution. The dress miniatures attributed to Way are cut, cut out paper profiled attached to fabric backgrounds. With the facial features carefully rendered in watercolor and sewn pieces of fabric faced with the bathroom with them clothes, no other miniature is known to have created such a clever um, and engaging depiction of the subject. Although it is common to find fashion plates embedded with fabric in France and England, the dress miniatures were idiosyncratic to designs in, within the American context. Way's artistic skills and knowledge came largely from close observation and hands-on empirical learning. Miniatures re also reinforced the ex um, exclusive economic ties. Sugar was at the heart of the lucrative West Indian trade in Southern Connecticut. A later variation of the British net trade networks involved direct transport of rum and other goods to and from New England. The Coit shipyard in New London built vessels for British merchantile and and interest in the 17th and 18th century. The deep water of the harbor dominated the area's trade after the 1760s. Mimicking the centuries old tradition of selling sugar and white lace and blue paper wrapping, the subtle tones of the blue double let and dark background set into the relief of uh, set in to relief the white of the bitter skin. Only the finest silk would retain such colors. The quality of the finely woven silk allows to viewers to appreciate the alternating tones and glistening luster still today. Um, for, uh, sorry, um, parishioners, um, uh, keep, or sorry, um, customers invest everyday objects with power. An 18th century American could theatrically draw this portrait from a pocket or private location within one home to spark limitless devotion. The portrait's social and material associations and function of elite networks make the object a tool to shift our attention from the, ob from the portrait to the surrounding material practices. 18th and 19th century audi you know, audiences cherish the seemingly animated, animated emotions of, of miniatures. As Robin Zappard Frank points out, the wig powder on the collar of the gentleman's jacket is a detail that would not have appeared in a formal portrait. Without the sitter's identity, this portrait is no longer functions as intended, calling attention to New London, New London society dependence on material signifiers and ritual, possibly a love charm with, with the lock of beloved hair, a token of wealth for a captain, an attempt to align himself with aristocracy or greater authority. Miniatures help to create a new registry of imagery for Americans and make the figure uh, and define the male figure within a global commerce. The subtle positioning of, the eye, of an eye-catching detail to convey individuality and prestige while it was a type of performance echoed in public polite society, possibly challenging the social distinctions between merchant and...